Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today we're sitting down to discuss Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens, a haunting tale of love and murder set in the marshlands of North Carolina. It's the latest book read by Kate's Book Club and has found millions of readers around the world since its publication in 2018. Appropriately, given our current corona lockdown situation, it's a book about a girl who lives isolated in the wilderness, wrestling with loneliness. Hollywood star and book club supremo Reese Witherspoon liked it so much she held off reading the last 10 pages so it wouldn't end and is currently developing it for film. The book has been a publishing phenomenon, a debut novel that sold more print copies in 2019 than any other adult title, fiction or non-fiction. But never mind all that, what did my book club think? They loved it, right? Well, keep listening to find out. So where are the crawdads sing? Tell me, who chose this one? So this was suggested by Natalie in my book club, who recommended it on the grounds that it was just a great escapist read, something that you could really curl up with late at night, a romance. We thought it would be a good change from our previous book, which was Hallie Rubenfold's The Five, which is about the women murdered by Jack the Ripper, which was excellent, but also quite a challenging read in some ways, sort of exacting read. So yes, you know, offer us an escapist romance. And we thought, great, we'll read that. I didn't know anything about this literary phenomenon I have to say apart from a vague you know I'd sort of seen it around you know you you, you flip past it online I'd seen the cover a few times to this point nothing about it had really captured my interest and I duly ordered it and it came and I started reading and within about eight pages I was completely hooked it is about well it starts with six-year-old Kaya who's the main character and we see her watch her mother leave her little shack that they live in in the North Carolina marshland. She's leaving her abusive husband and her five children. So Kyra is one of five. And not long after the mother leaves, the older siblings leave. They also can't really bear it anymore. And then finally, Kaya's brother, the one nearest in age, Jody, leaves. And so she is alone with her father. And they manage to coexist fairly uneasily for a couple more years. And then he also leaves and she is alone. The book flips back and forth in chronology between Kaya's childhood growing up, which is 1950s, 1952, and the events that happen in 1969 when a body is found in the marsh. And I want to read the prologue just so you can get a sense of the writing and also that sets up the crime element of this book. Marsh is not swamp. Marsh is a space of light where grass grows in water and water flows into the sky. Slow-moving creeks wander, carrying the orb of the sun with them to the sea, and long-legged birds lift with unexpected grace, as though not built to fly, against the roar of a thousand snow geese. Then, within the marsh, here and there, true swamp crawls into low-lying bogs, hidden in clammy forests. Swamp water is still and dark, having swallowed the light in its muddy throat. Even night crawlers are diurnal in this lair. There are sounds, of course, but compared to the marsh, the swamp is quiet because decomposition is cellular work. Life decays and reeks and returns to the rotted duff, a poignant wallow of death forgetting life. On the morning of October the 30th, 1969, the body of Chase Andrews lay in the swamp, which would have absorbed it silently, routinely, hiding it for good. A swamp knows all about death and doesn't necessarily define it as tragedy, certainly not as sin. But this morning, two boys from the village rode their bikes out to the old fire tower and, from the third switchback, spotted his denim jacket. And then it goes on. And if you're me, you think, ooh. (laughs) No, it is a really strong (laughs) opening. And it showcases what she's very good at, which is descriptions of nature. And I don't know if you looked into Delia Owens, but she has had an incredible life. She was a wildlife scientist, a biologist in Zambia. And she's written three books in the past or co-written, I think probably with her husband at the time, beautiful nature memoirs about her time there, you know, living in the Kalahari Desert. And this is her first novel. And I think that experience of writing about nature probably makes 
that aspect of her writing stand out, whereas I would suggest there are other elements of this book that perhaps are weaker. Hmm. Well, I was going to just finish with the plot. Kaya never goes to school, but she does make a friend, a boy from the village, who is as fascinated by the natural world as she is. And he shares his love of reading with her and gives her textbooks to study. She also makes enemies as she veers between her desire to trust people and her fear of being hurt again. So she's isolated, but she's not totally cut off from the world. She has these links. She has this boy, Tate, who she gets to know, who is her kind of educational lifeline. And she has Jumpin'. He runs a kind of... Um, a gas station. Petrol yeah, station. for boats. A floating one in yeah. the middle of the swamp. And he sells seafood and various bits and bobs. And so the way that she actually manages to survive economically is that she goes out and she gathers mussels and she takes them over to him very early in the morning and he buys them off her. And there's a sort of sense that he somehow knows or intuits that she's, you know, she's very, very young when she first meets him and he senses that all is not right and he basically takes the seafood and gives her money, but he's not really selling it, I don't think. He's trying to help her out. And then this then develops into a lifelong friendship that continues throughout the book. We should say at the beginning, it's quite hard to talk about this book without too many spoilers. I'd like to try and talk about it in sort of general terms rather than really giving the game away. In our book club, not everyone had finished it when we discussed it. And actually in book club, we have a policy where that's fine. If you haven't finished it, you know, you don't mind if people spoil it for you because that's fair enough. You haven't finished it. But with this one, we just didn't want to spoil that ending and that sort of reveal that you finally get because so much of the enjoyment of this book, I think, comes from that desire to know how it all unfolds. How does she manage to transcend this appalling childhood and this isolation that she grows up in and become a functioning person? And then also this murder mystery that she is sort of entangled with that eventually concludes with a sort of courtroom drama. So for me, this book ticks quite a few boxes because it had the romance as one angle. And then, sure, there's the crime novel. I mean, I'm not particularly a fan of crime novels, but I like the hook with this one. And then the courtroom drama. I love a courtroom drama. So when it got to that, I was like, great. I settled <laughs> in. I was very happy. And, uh, and then there is this nature writing and this, this almost artistic creative element that I saw in it that I really responded to. I, I really love that. There's a sense as she grows older, she starts to translate her knowledge of the marsh and this natural world that she knows so well and she identifies with so strongly and she starts to record it and collect it. And as she grows older, this becomes more methodical, a bit more scientific, even though she doesn't really think in those terms. By the time she's become an adult, it's become a kind of amazing, extraordinary collection of neatly labeled shelves, meticulous watercolors where everything is labeled and maps showing where things are from. And I found all that really evocative. I love that. I thought it was almost like walking around a really fantastic museum where you see all these things. I like that bit. I finished this book and thought, oh, that was so great. Natalie was so right. It was such a brilliant read. And then I had a little bit of a... Um, a premonition, a kind of warning about what my book club's reaction might be. Because <laughs> I idly looked on Goodreads because I didn't know anything about it. And I was just curious. I mean, how could I not have known about this book? And I looked on Goodreads, which of course is the website where people post their reviews. It's probably the most popular reviewing site. And immediately saw some very strong counter opinions. And I was kind of like, oh, oh, I hadn't thought that, you know. <laughs> Well, that makes me feel a lot better because yeah, I no, have to say. I, I think feel free to let rip because this is a book, I think, that definitely divides people. I have made some notes and I made these notes off the top of my head, not even going back to the book. And it starts off so many issues with this book. And then I've started <laughs> to number my thoughts and I got up to 12 before I thought, mm, OK, well, that's enough. I won't even be able to get through them all. I'm actually almost, I don't know, slightly self-conscious or worried about how much I just liked this book simply because it is so popular. No, you know, though, I'm like, am I just being a terrible snob? I thought the dialogue, the dialogue is truly awful, just terrible, shockingly bad. Did you not notice this? Like, it's what, painful. Do you mean the exchanges between characters or do you mean the way that she renders this North Carolina accent? Both. My biggest problem with the patois, well, one, it is quite jarring. And although I don't know anything about how people at this time in this environment, you know, these are very uneducated, isolated people. They're called the Marsh people. And I don't want to go too off on a tangent, but of course, you know, this was a real culture. These people lived in the North Carolina marshes and had done for hundreds of years. But what bothers me most about the patois is that Kaya speaks in a very thick patois until suddenly... She completely switches and talks like a scientist. And 
that's just utterly unbelievable because even if you are educating yourselves with books, that's not going to change how you speak verbally. Where on earth is she going to learn how to speak differently? She learns from Tate. No. And he speaks, he speaks proper. Mm. He does a little bit, but even his father is a fisherman, so he's not going to talk brilliantly. They don't even have that much time together. But no, what I really wanted to highlight is the dialogue. Give me a second. Just going to find a choice line. <laughs> so speaking of Tate, his father at one point in a brilliant bit of exposition says, I want you to know, son, how proud I am of you. All on your own. You've studied the marsh life, done real well at school, applied for college to get a degree in science and got accepted. I'm just not the kind to speak on such things much, but I'm mighty proud of you, son. All right. So just in case you didn't know any of those things, you now know them all. Rather than the narrator telling you, the father's going to spell it out. But you do know those things because you then follow why... Tate's journey. Okay. Uh, then through... what... See, this is one of... Cause... Kate, Kate, that these... makes it worse. These no issues... one speaks like that. Partly the issues of what people were doing and how you knew about what they were doing came up in book club. And my feeling was you see it through Kaya's fragmented observations of the people in the town who she observes in the same way that she observes the natural world around her. You know, she's held apart from all of that, but she's fascinated by it. She's watching it and she learns. Well, that breaks down, though, because at one point we're given her parents' entire backstory, of which she has absolutely no knowledge. The narrator just chucks it in there. I also like this. This is Tate to Kaya when he's reunited with her. Look at you. So beautiful. A woman. You doing okay? When's that from? Uh, that's from when he comes back from uh, university. Yeah. You doing okay? Still selling muscles? He was astonished at how she had changed. Her features more refined yet haunting. Her cheekbones sharp, lips full. Ah, oh, well, now the descriptions of Kaya are, but, are another issue. But, but going back to the dialogue, I found, you know, I don't have any idea how people from North Carolina speak. But I found, for me, it just evoked this sense of a drawl, of a rhythm, of the way that they might shorten words. And I just didn't worry about it too much. They're like musical notes. I didn't worry too much about the actual words. What I got from it was the sense of how people might have sounded. And so for me, that worked. And I didn't pick it apart in that way. But I mean, you're absolutely not alone. There were several people in my book club who just could not get past the dialogue. And also an issue with the fact that the white characters, their speech is represented one way and the black characters, their speech is represented very differently. And Amanda found that quite problematic. And you know, so worried about that. Again, it didn't really bother me. I didn't really think too much about it. Race um, is on my list of problems with this book. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to pick up on Kaya, perhaps, because she is the focal point of this whole book. And I think definitely the sense that she was a little bit too extraordinary. And we are often told about how beautiful she was. But also Amanda picked up on, you know, she's very thin. And that's sort of presented as almost like an ideal, you know, it's a good thing. When as Amanda said, you know, she's just been so scrawny and half starved. That's a very good And point. actually, I was just idly looking around online and I found a good line from someone with some kind of medical background who articulated what Amanda was fretting about. Maybe it's because I work in the medical field, but I have a very hard time believing that a seven-year-old with no money would be able to survive this type of environment with just a shack with no running water, no way to bathe and lack of food. The author described plenty of beautiful things in these wetlands, but failed to mention the dangers, crocodiles, mosquitoes, sinkholes, hurricanes, etc. <laughs> At one point, the author describes when her brother was hit in the face with a fireplace poker, a gash that left a massive scar, and said her mother just sewed it up with her sewing needle without access to to healthcare and antibiotics, that kid would have died from a massive infection. <laughs> and so, and surely Delia Owens knows this. She's well, a scientist. Yeah, I, but you know, I mean, it comes down to what well, we're going to come. We're going to circle around to this again. But you know, it, it comes down to whether you mind about these things or whether you're happy to just be swept along. It really, I think it does. You know, for some people, these little problems, these little inconsistencies totally disrupted any enjoyment they might have derived from the story because they kept being jarred out. So Andy Kay is a newcomer to my book club. Because of these corona times, he's a delightful newcomer to my book club who I've never actually met in person. But I've now enjoyed his company in two Zoom book clubs and I'm loving having him. He's a very enjoyable addition to the group. So I didn't realise because I just don't know him very well. He's a you know, friend of a friend. He seems to have some kind of naturalist background. He seems to know about, you know, nature and things. <laughs> and so he had issues with that, which surprised me because, as you mentioned earlier, Delia Owens does have this background in science and nature writing. She's a published author. She's 
lived for most of her life in Africa, working with animals, and has written extensively about this. And so one of the pleasures for me was feeling like I didn't have to worry about all that, and that this was underpinned by a scientific understanding of the natural world that really, I thought, gave this book a depth and maybe a weight to it that it needed. Anyway, Andy started blowing holes even in that. So I'm not sure if you remember when Kaya's distressed, she returns to her place of solace, which is this beach, and there are these herring gulls that are there. Hmm. And she feeds the herring gulls. She's been doing it since she was a child. And to her, the herring gulls are almost like people. And there's one particular herring gull called Big Red that she talks to. And then Andy said at one point she refers to generations of herring gulls that she has known. And Andy said the lifespan of the herring gull is 30 years. So at that point, he sort of (laughs) put the book down. He was like, there's no way she could have known generations of herring gulls when a herring gull lives for 30 years. And I was like, what? (laughs) So another thing that happens is she doesn't have access to people or other humans to sort of learn about the world. She's learning it all from these school textbooks and what she's observing. There are often moments where she's taking something that's happening in the natural world and then she's applying it to her relationships. So there's a mm. quite a lovely little sequence about the fireflies and what the fireflies are up to, sending signals to one another. And she's relating that to her relationship with Tate and her relationship with Chase, who is another man who comes into her life. And there's a sequence, quite a powerful sequence, with the praying mantis. Do you remember that? Powerful, painful, laboured. And and at that point, again, Andy kind of dropped the book and he's like, I can't believe she's going to go there. Is she really going to make this obvious link between what the praying mantis gets up to and, and, you know, this woman who's suspected of a crime? And, you know, it was awful. I mean, you know, again, for me, I was just like, I didn't mind. It was fine. Well, you're in the majority. Well, no, I'm not. He said, well, in my book club, I have Not to say, in your book club. I just mean with, like, the rest of the world. I don't know. I suspect the rest of the world is probably as split up as us because even the people who didn't like it still bought it. So by, by what everyone measures everything by, which is sales, it's mm. the same. But mm. I think my book club certainly were pretty 50-50 even split, which is the best possible thing, I think, for a really good, lively book club discussion. And we certainly had that. Um, should, should we talk about the sex or lack thereof? Yes. Let's talk about the sex. Oh, so So what was the problem? Too much or not enough or... Well, just not enough. There's no pleasure allowed. It's like, ooh, sex, ooh, dirty. Yeah, I have to say, for me, a moment where I really thought, hmm, you know, I just can't quite believe this. It's a very idealized relationship between Tate and Kaya. You know, he is ridiculously kind and sweet and generous as she, like the sort of wild thing, gradually comes to trust him. and, And then they do begin this relationship. And of course, she hasn't been with a man before. And then, you know, there's a long period where they're just sort of kissing and it's all very chaste and, you know, he's always holding back from going too far. And then there's one time when they both feel that the time is right. And then it does get quite explicit, I suppose, in the text. You know, really like, oh, wow, you know, it's all happening now. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then at that one moment, he's just like, you know, it's all just suddenly about to happen and she's ready and she wants it to happen so much. And then he's like, no, 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 <laughs> it's not the right time. I can't take advantage of you like this. I'm just going to step away. And I was like, really? Mm, I don't think so. I mean, these are like two very horny teenagers. Yeah, it seemed a bit unlikely to me. And I just thought like, because later on they're without giving anything away when she does finally have sex. It's an awful experience and there's shame attached to it. And I was just like, if she's this isolated, where is the shame coming from? Yes, Amanda thought that. Amanda's problem was that a lot of her reactions to things are socialized reactions is it that where you know we're conditioned to think a certain way by the society that we all live in so yes this idea of sex is somehow a shameful thing and that we should be embarrassed by it or you know feel that we've done the wrong thing or whatever you know a man was like she wouldn't have any of those feelings if her knowledge of the world and society came from looking at nature she's not going to be thinking those things i mean my rebuttal to this was again to come back to that point that i feel like i think the author covers it To me, although Kaya is isolated and yes, mainly she's sort of in the natural world, she's not uninterested in the town and the people. And in fact, she's fascinated by them and she's always trying to learn how to behave and how to fit in. Even though she doesn't want to, she wants to hold herself apart, but that doesn't mean that she's not fascinated by that world. So for me, it was covered. So we're skirting around it, but there is this murder at the heart of the story. The book starts off with this murder. I'm not a crime reader. 
I don't really like crime novels. I don't really like the way that they're often quite clinical and that drip, drip, drip of information just drives me wild. For this, which is really crime light, isn't it? I mean, it's not really... I called it cosy crime and Sally picked me up on it because that's not the definition of cosy crime. Cosy crime is usually set in a little village somewhere and I don't know, it's like murder around the tea table or I don't know what. But anyway, my thinking, the reason I said that was because there's no real trauma here. It's all quite clean. There's nothing to really upset or distress you as a reader. You know, you don't really care very much about the character who's murdered. It just felt quite untroubling. And mm. that's the kind of crime that I want to read about, really. I don't really want to read about <laughs> horrible, twisted murders and awful things. So, you know, it's as unworrisome as everything else in this book. I think one of the main things that kept coming up is, again, for the people who loved it, it was just an escape. It was a, a book that transported us. It took us away. We didn't worry too much about the details, the herring gulls, lifespan, whether or not she would have known how to have sex, you know, <laughs> <laughs> how she learned to talk nicely, you know. It, it, we didn't worry about it because we just loved being in that world and we loved the idea of this character. Maybe that's it, you know, it's, it's about loving the idea of a character and not minding too much whether that character could possibly really have existed or not. I don't know. Maybe. I just felt the characters were generally really flat. To be fair, yes. I think, again, this is a major criticism in my book club, was that the characters, apart from Kaya, are largely really one-dimensional. They don't really have much to them at all. They're very stereotypical. They're very kind of cardboard cutout. Again, you know, <laughs> Didn't how, much, how, much do you, <laughs> how much do you really get? <laughs> I mean, there you know, are novels where I care about that. There are novels where I want my characters to be full of depth and nuance and well-rounded. But this isn't one of those novels. This is a novel where, you know, you just want to be swept along by the whole experience. And, and I don't mind too much that I didn't know about Chase Andrews's childhood. Or My problem uh, is the romance is that if I'm going to read a romance, I do want to feel that there's a connection between the characters or I'm just not going to care and that was the case for me I was like who's Tate I don't know you know we keep being told that they care about each other but we're being told regularly rather than shown hmm. I mean there was an emotional connection wasn't there because even from when she was very young he was kind to her and I think there's a thread that runs through this about someone who has been abandoned by her mother and then her siblings and then her father and who yearns for a connection with people and yet at the same time is terrified of having that connection because she knows the pain of loss. And so there's this thread that runs through about someone who's reaching out all the time, who's reaching out emotionally, who wants to connect, and yet at the same time is fiercely protective and fiercely guarded because she doesn't want to feel that pain again. And, and that emotional hook kept me very happily turning the pages and I thought that Tate he's the one who breaks through you know he's the one that she trusts did you guys rate the book yeah we did so it's quite interesting just the split people who <laughs> people who loved it really loved it and people who hated it really hated it <laughs> um what did Sally say I imagine Sally was in the hate camp yeah Sally really didn't like it I mean I felt very sorry for Sally because I think part of the problem was that she expected that she would like it and so she was just disappointed. She said, I expected to enjoy this. I love romance, crime stories and genre fiction. But for me, this failed on every level. As nature writing, because I couldn't picture the place she described. As romance, because the characters were so one dimensional. As a crime drama, because it was so full of plot holes. And as a courtroom drama, because that was all so boring. I found the family <laughs> dynamics impossible to swallow. I found it increasingly annoying as it went on. And if it hadn't been for book club, I'm afraid I wouldn't have finished it. Ah, oh, Sally, I couldn't have put it better. Andy Kay, not believable enough. I wanted to enjoy it so much, but there's some really crucial bits where it didn't hold true for me as a description of the natural landscape, which was disappointing. The murder mystery bits felt like Angela Lansbury, a murder she wrote. But, he says, I have to allow it was a good page turner. And I did want to know what happened in the end until it got to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, what did Amanda say? The positives were, so I gave it one star, one star out of five stars. The Oof. positives were that I did enjoy the nature writing and the scene setting. But as I go through, I'm finding it harder and harder to believe the central character just doesn't feel authentic. And I find the whole racial dimension troubling. But I also will say it possibly compares quite badly to the last book I read, which was Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. Do you remember me talking about that I one? I do, yeah. Which, yes, I think unarguably... <laughs> is, uh, you know, in did literary she, terms and as a crime thriller is probably a better book. Um, did she win the Nobel Prize for literature? Yes, she did. <laughs> she says, yeah, perhaps... Different Am standard. Amanda says, perhaps also, I'm not really much of an escapist reader. I want something with more meat and depth. 
What did lovely Natalie say? Well, Natalie, yes. I was really carried away by this. I connected with it emotionally. I did feel it had a good sense of place. So I, we didn't talk about it, but actually one of the surprising divisions with Book Club was that some people felt it really did evoke this place and we could imagine what these marshlands were like and I, you know, had a kind of sense of these shimmering beaches and the sort of trees and, 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 and the natural world all seemed quite vivid and real to us. And then the other people were just completely baffled and said they had no sense of what this swamp marshland was like and they couldn't picture it i mean that's a major Mm. difference you know either you have all this imagery sort of glowing away in your head as you read it or you don't and if you don't i could see why it might all fall rather flat yeah and i didn't really have it i had to google pictures to try and give myself something to go on how interesting so natalie went on i didn't spot any factual errors so there wasn't anything to jolt me out of my enjoyment. So not saying that they weren't there, but she didn't spot them. I, I would say the same for me. <laughs> and I really like the ending and the way the author wraps things up. I really lived in this book while I read it. I thought Aww. that was such a nice way of something. I felt the same way. And then Robert was another fan. Actually, he hadn't finished it. He was only a third of the way through, but he said, I'm completely hooked. I don't think the characters are wooden. I'm really enjoying it. And my disbelief is firmly suspended. It's escapism and I'm enjoying it. A nice contrast from my last read, which is Michel Wilbach. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever read any of him. He's a French, quite a challenging French author who Robert <laughs> really likes. But gosh, yeah, I'm extremely wary of having read a couple of his books. Stuart gave it five stars. He no. Said, Call me a romantic, but I <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed the mix of romance, mystery and courtroom drama. Everything tied up for me and I was happy to suspend disbelief. Interestingly, he said, I spent a lot of time in Georgia and I've been to the Carolinas, so that might have added to my enjoyment. For me, it really did capture a sense of the place. And I certainly met some larger than life characters that made me more inclined to believe the scenarios in this book. I was completely absorbed by it. I thought it had real momentum and I was genuinely surprised by the reveals at the end. It will make a really good movie. And he said, as for me, I think Owens has made a really successful transition from science writer to novelist. Her background added to the story, but it never overshadowed it. The balance worked really well. I agree with that. For me, as I said, I felt it was the nature writing that was sort of giving this book the kind of depth and the anchor that I felt it needed. You know, otherwise, what is it? It's just a sort of Nicholas Sparks romance. I mean, you know. Yeah. It, there's not really much to... to yeah. But... <laughs> But if you, if you see beyond that, Laura, <laughs> as I did, <laughs> um, no, I, I, for me, I felt that nature writing was the thing that hooked it. But actually, you know, subsequently thinking about it more, there's a very nice quote from Alexandra Fuller, who wrote a book we did a long time ago for book club called Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight, which is really good. She said, a lush debut novel, Owens delivers her mystery wrapped in gorgeous lyrical prose. It's clear she's from this place, the land of the southern coasts, but also the emotional terrain. You can feel it in the pages, a magnificent achievement, ambitious, credible, and very timely. It's that, isn't it? It's the emotional terrain. I just realized, gosh, yes, that's what I'm responding to. And that's the truth that I'm sensing in this. You know, the rest of it is total frippery flimflam. Of course it is. But for me, it felt like it had this, this thread of emotional truth, something that the author understood and experienced that then lent itself to these barely credible characters, this scenario, the rest of it, you know, for me... I think it was that. I think that's the thing that, that I responded to. And I suspect perhaps the many people who have enjoyed it. But, you know, it's, it's, it is a hilariously divisive book. <laughs> I've just bought a copy to send to my mother-in-law, who's currently struggling through The Plague by uh, Camus for her book club who just like to torture themselves. And I said, oh, yeah. for goodness sake, I'm going to send you something. Read that. I mean, she'll finish the plague, but I was like, this will be light relief. And then, you know, busy dispatched it. And then I just thought, gosh, is she going to like it? You know what? I don't think she will, actually. <laughs> I think she's probably going to be in the Sally Amanda, you oh, know. that's all right. She Andy can listen Kay, to this episode Laura and not Peacom. along. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what she makes of it. Might have to follow up in a future episode. I have to say, I know it would have been a brilliant book club book because I was so looking forward to tearing it apart with you. <laughs> and I think the people who really didn't like it would have loved to have had you on board because that would have tipped the balance. But yeah, I cannot recommend this book highly enough as a book club book. And I guess you just have to judge for yourselves if from the sound of everything we've said, you think it might be something that you would like, then rush, rush to get a copy because you'll love it and it will transport you. And I mean, yeah, I was up until 2am reading this book. I loved it. I didn't want to put it down. Yeah, and I was so bored. About halfway mm. through, it completely lost me. Mm. <laughs> so there's the two extremes for you listeners. Mm. 
Inspired by Where the Crawdads Sing, here are some recommendations for your next book club book. I want to recommend Furious Hours, The Last Trial of Harper Lee by Casey Sepp. It made the shortlist for last year's Bailey Gifford Prize, which I always think is such a good source for discovering great nonfiction books. It's a little bit tangential, but I'm going to make a case for it. It's the story <laughs> of Harper Lee, who became a literary sensation with To Kill a Mockingbird, as we all know, and was celebrated and fated, but who famously never managed to publish another book. As an arch procrastinator myself, I loved this exploration of what it was that held Lee back. This book is effectively three books in one. It begins with the story of a black preacher, the Reverend Maxwell, and he's accused of murdering five of his family members for insurance money. This all happened in the 1970s. With the help of an unscrupulous lawyer, he escaped justice for years until finally a relative shot him dead at the funeral of his last victim. So this is just a kind of a great crime murder mystery story that opens the book, true crime. And then the second part is the murder trial. And Lee was researching this trial. She was interested in writing a non-fiction book in the style of her great friend Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, which she had helped him. She worked with him on that book as a researcher. And it's hard to quantify to what degree her input made that book as remarkable as it is. We did it a long time ago for Book Club. And that in itself is an amazing read. I really recommend that. So she, she was researching this murder trial and she had transcripts of the trial in her materials. And so Casey Sepp acquires all this material that Harper Lee had gathered. And so she's able to recreate in incredibly vivid detail this trial. And so there's this real courtroom drama that you get really absorbed into. It's absolutely fascinating. And then thirdly, and obviously most importantly, is the story of Lee herself. You know, why did she have this writer's block? What happened? And how she hoped that this story, when she finally latched onto something that really seemed to kind of kindle her interest and inspire her, she hoped that this would be the story that would get her past this writer's block. But in the end, it's a book about someone who came to a kind of uneasy peace with the fact that she wasn't going to write something else. And it's just really fascinating I loved it. Helen MacDonald, who wrote H's for Hawk, which is another book that we did for Book Club a long time ago, which we also absolutely loved. She said, It's been a long time since I picked up a book so impossible to put down. Furious hours made me forget dinner, ignore incoming calls, and stay up reading into the small hours. It's a work of literary and legal detection as gripping as a thriller, but it's also a meditation on motive and mystery, the curious workings of history, hope, and ambition, justice, and the darkest matters of life and death. Casey Sepp's investigation into an infamous Southern murder trial and Harper Lee's quest to write about it is a beautiful, sobering and sometimes chilling triumph. So it has that connection with the South. Obviously, Alabama is, is a little bit away from North Carolina. But, you know, to me, one of the things about Crawdads was this, this sort of sense of the South, you know, to an English person, you know, I don't really know. It just all <laughs> seemed very exotic to me. And, um, and so this came to mind. And also it's got the courtroom drama. And it's got that thread, I think, of someone who is a real creative force, but is also someone who's very isolated, who's a loner. You know, Harper Lee isolated herself in a way because she was so repelled by the limelight that she was sort of thrust into. She really couldn't bear it. And it's just a fascinating psychological study of what made her the person that she was. And there are some really interesting and lovely passages about her childhood and that friendship with Truman Capote and what it was like growing up together. You know, they both came from quite poor backgrounds. And so, yeah, it just kind of came to mind when I was thinking about Crawdads. It's got different threads to it, but I think Casey Sepp does an absolutely beautiful job of drawing them all together. And I really love this. I loved it. And I think it would be a great book club book. It sounds brilliant. It's completely not on my radar. Yeah, I read it a little while ago, and I've just been looking for an excuse to talk about it, really. <laughs> I don't know why it took me so long. Well, I'm then going to pick up on a different thread of Where the Crawdads Sing. I'm going to pick up on the nature writing, and indeed, I suppose you could say a strong female character. I want to recommend Amy Liptrop's The Outrun, which is a memoir, and my book club read it, ooh, probably five, six, seven years ago now, pre-podcast days and absolutely adored it. I think I read that too on your recommendation, and I loved it. It is the memoir of Amy Liptrot, who wrote it in her early 30s, and it weaves together 
her very traumatic downward spiral in East London as her alcoholism ran away from her. She was, for all intents and purposes, a nice middle class girl, but she had this sort of wild streak to her. And she traces that back to her upbringing in the Orkney Islands, off the northern coast of Scotland. Now, as it is, I'm quite obsessed with the Orkney Islands because my mother's family were from there. Oh. And since re yeah, and since reading this book, I have been. So when I knew I was going to recommend it, I started to reread it. And it is so beautiful. The writing is fantastic. Amy Liptron had a real tense relationship with the island. She was desperate to get away. She was desperate to get to London. She really wanted to be in the center of things. And she does. She goes to University of Edinburgh, incidentally, with one of my book club members yeah. who recommended this book. They work together on the Edinburgh student newspaper. And then she makes her way down to London. And she was probably, you know, partying in East London, hanging out in London fields, maybe five years probably before I would have done. I mean, hey, I, I was definitely no wild child like Amy Liptrop. But that life is very familiar to me. And then there's this other thread to the story, which is how she managed to stay sober. So she returns to Orkney after attending a rehab center. She initially stays with her father, who is quite a character, more about him later. But then she goes even further and she ends up being a researcher, keeping track of birds on the tiny, tiny island of Papi, which is one of the most northern of the Orkney Islands and only has 90 residents. And she spends an entire winter there alone, swimming in the ice cold water every morning. I remember there's a lot of extreme cold water swimming. Yes, but this is it. Like the writing is so beautiful that I have this vision of her snorkeling through the crystal clear waters, I think in a wetsuit. Yeah. But I remember reading it and almost feeling like I was being transported. I felt like I was there with her. That's how beautiful her writing is. So you have these two amazing threads that are at utter contrast to one another. Her life in East London, which was quite degenerate, really. Mm. You know, she just couldn't stop the partying and it ruined all of her relationships. And then you have this utter solitude in one of the most beautiful places in the world, all alone on these windswept islands. I was just going to read the opening because, you know, we picked up on where the crawdads sing and said, oh, you know, what an amazing opening it is. I don't know if you remember the first couple paragraphs of this book. This is the prologue. Under whirring helicopter blades, a young woman holds her newborn baby as she is pushed in a wheelchair along the runway of the island airport to meet a man in a straight jacket being pushed in a wheelchair from the other direction. That day, the two 28-year-olds had been treated at the small hospital nearby. The woman was helped to deliver her first child. The man, shouting and out of control, was restrained and sedated. And then just skipping down a few paragraphs. My mum introduces the man, my dad, to his tiny daughter and briefly places me in his lap before he is taken into the aircraft and flown away. What she says to him is covered by the sound of the engine or carried off by the wind. Gives me goosebumps mm, just reading it. My goodness. And so Amy Liptrot is very much delving back into that past because her father had very precarious mental health and had a number of mental breakdowns throughout her life. Was he bipolar? Yes, yes, he was bipolar, exactly. And I think he had mild schizophrenia as well. And she has had and seems to have a very loving relationship to a certain extent. But obviously there are deep scars from having been exposed to this sort of level of mental trauma as a child. A beautiful book. My book club adored it. I think it would probably be up there and, you know, one of our favorite books we've ever read. So vetted and very powerful. And my God, is it better written than Where the Crawdads Sing? Well, it's an opinion. Other opinions are available. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. You might, people might not enjoy it as much, but surely they would think it's better written. Oh, I don't know. I think we're going to get hate mail from Crawdads fans. But yes, no, I love that too. So I do heartily endorse that recommendation. It's a great read. That's all for this episode. Books mentioned were The Five by Howley Rubenhold, Furious Hours by Casey Sepp, In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald, and The Outrun by Amy Liptrop. On our next book club show, we'll be discussing Everything Under by Daisy Johnson, a contemporary reworking of the Oedipus Rex story that made the 2018 Man Booker Prize shortlist. Critics have called the book a force of nature, the kind of book that worms its way into your brain, leaving echoes of its story and world long after it is back on the shelf, wrote Rebecca Nicholson in The Observer, 
calling it beautifully creepy and affecting. But did it make for good book club discussion? Listen in to find out. And coming soon, we also have an interview with Claire Hanscombe of BritLit, the podcast that brings the British book world to the American masses. We'll be getting some of her top recommendations for book club and her favorite lockdown reads. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what we do, please take a moment to rate, review and subscribe to us on iTunes. It helps other listeners find us and means you'll never miss an episode. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>